Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And, and before I dig into this presentation, I just want to commend the folks of the great state of Texas, you for being here, and your Secretary of State's office, the Secretary, the Deputy Secretary, for making this happen for you. This is unique in the United States. We have the barest handful of states that have managed to, to make the opportunity to bring their notaries into the Capitol, to bring their notaries to a location, and provide them training. And good on you for being here, and, and thank you so much to the Secretary's office for making this happen for you. I'm kind of curious, how many of you folks, because I know that education is not required in Texas, but I imagine some of you have availed yourselves of it, and you're going to be at different points in your notary um, experience. So how many of you are in your first commission term? I'm curious. Okay, great. We have a ton of eye-opening material for you. You'll be hearing a lot of this for the first time. How many of you are in your second or even third commission term? Okay, plenty of experienced notaries. Well, the message for those of you who are brand new is pretty obvious. This is all new to you. You are just starting to really experience different situations and, and um, documents presented to you. Now, for those of you who are more experienced, this is a nuts and bolts presentation. And, and you know what? I'm a wanderer, so point me back to the podium if I get too far away from, from the microphone. I apologize. Um, but for those of you who are, who are more experienced, I have a word of encouragement for you. Even though this is a nuts and bolts presentation, it's really important to deconstruct and remind ourselves what we're doing when we're performing a notarial act. It is so important. The evidence that you create is, is so heavily relied upon. It can really refresh your resolve to do this in the most compliant, appropriate, thoughtful way that you can. So, you know, again, even though it's nuts and bolts, I, I hope that there's something here for everyone. And let's see. We will try to get my presentation going. Oh, yeah. This is complicated for me. <laughs> so today's discussion, you know, rather than focus only on the individual steps of performing a notarial act, We'll get to that, but I really want to start the discussion with an examination of some principles that maybe you haven't thought about in a while. You know, it's, it's why are documents notarized? That's really important. What are a notary's fundamental responsibilities? And, and I bring that up because there's a whole layer of responsibilities to your office of notary that is wrapped all around the fact that you are an authorized official who can you know, perform a notarial act and create an, a notarial record and, you know, um, sign and seal your certificate. You have all kinds of um, administrative responsibilities to your office that are very important to discuss. So we're going to talk about some of those today. And also, we're going to look at how a notary performs the individual authorized duties appropriately. So that's how we're going to try to structure the, the conversation. So we'll get started with <clears throat> not that. Let's see. Okay. Again, y'all bear with me. That, that's what we're looking for. Okay. Why are documents notarized? I find this profound. First of all, remember, every time you notarize, that's not the end of the life of your notarial act. There are parties who are relying on the effects of that act for some reason. What you do on that, on that notarial certificate lives on. And your notarial act creates really important assurances for the parties who are relying on that document. And, and here they are. First of all, that the document signing was witnessed by an impartial public official who had the authority upon this witnessing to certify to the facts of what happened. That's powerful. Also, relying parties are looking for the assurance that the signer who participated in this transaction seemed to be understanding the transaction, was doing this of his or her own free will, and was aware of the consequences of the transaction. Again, very powerful for you to be there to observe that. The very fact that you complete your, not your notarial certificate um, asserts that this happened. And again, that notarial certificate it is the piece of evidence that lives on of your notarial act. 
and what's so amazing about the notarial certificate, wherever that document goes in its life after you've notarized, it is recognized as it crosses state borders that the act and, and what has been evidenced in the notarial certificate is reliable evidence that these things actually occurred, that a person who was named as the particular signer swore an oath or acknowledged the signature, that that person was identified, that that person um, subscribed the document in your presence, that these things happened in a particular place on a particular um, day, all of that uh, is just so important, again, to creating the assurances of a notarial act that everyone else relies on. So to produce these assurances, you have to do this reliably. How do you reliably produce the assurances of a notarial act? Well, first of all, you have consistency. You have a consistent methodology for performing notarial acts properly. And you also are mindful of the various responsibilities of your office. And I mentioned that. Again, you have a layer of responsibilities wrapped around the fact that you can perform notarial acts. You're, you know, by minding those responsibilities, you're upholding the trust in your office, not just your notarial act, but in your office as a whole. You manage to do all this by having training and ongoing opportunities to enhance your knowledge and to stay sharp on the things that you've already learned. All of these things are very necessary, again, so you can reliably produce the assurances of the Notarial Act. So one of the first responsibilities that you'll encounter after you've gone through the commissioning process is your responsibility to be properly equipped to do your job. And you all know this, you're all notaries, these are very familiar items to you, but you're responsible for these things. You're responsible for having a seal of office, not just having what anyone will make for you, but knowing that the seal of office you've obtained absolutely complies with the requirements in statute and in rule for how that seal will appear on the document and the information elements that will be conveyed through that seal. You're responsible for recording all of your notarial acts in a record book. There are very specific <coughs> guidelines for what you record in that record book, so again, very important that you know, you know the nature of that essential tool and what you're supposed to do with it. Um, all of you are responsible for conspicuously posting a list of the fees that you may charge. How many of you do have a fee list posted in your office? And so here we are. That this is you know, yet another reason that we want to make sure that you know these things and that you are periodically going back and reading your statutes and reading your administrative rules and understanding what the responsibilities of your office are. That may seem like a, an administrative detail, but at the same time, if we're talking about promoting public trust in what you do, it makes perfect sense to have a publicly posted list of fees so that customers know that what you are doing is within the boundaries of, of law. Um, you're also responsible for being for itemizing or being prepared to itemize for a customer the fees that you may charge and that you intend to charge for a particular notarial transaction. Um, again, that, that is um, not necessarily the case in every state. It certainly is the case here. To be fully and properly equipped, you want to make sure that you have the ability to write out an itemized receipt for the fees and, and be able to present that, that to your customer. Now, I've, I've mentioned the bond as an essential tool. I mean, we all know that, that you're required to have it, the, a $10,000 bond for performance of your duties, but one thing that's important about the bond is it is, it, it provides a surety for the public that if a member of the public is harmed by your misdeeds, your improper acts, um, your negligence in performing a notarial act, and they are financially harmed, they do have some recourse. They can get some kind of settlement from the bond. Um, true, if, if the bond is paid out because of something that, that you did, you will owe the bond company back for that. But the bond still remains an important tool, again, when we're talking about promoting the public trust. The public knows that there is a mechanism for being made whole for 
um, bad notarial acts, and so it's important. I also very much want you to consider having the, the vehicle that protects you, and that's notary errors and emissions insurance. This is insurance that is traditional. It is for you to help you in situations where your unintentional mistake or error has caused harm and um, initiated a claim. Um, all of these things, the errors and emissions insurance is very modestly priced for the pr protection and the peace of mind it affords to you. Um, you should consider it um, as part of the, your essential tools toolkit. So, I, you know, again, I keep mentioning these um, fundamental responsibilities that are wrapped around your core duties. And notarization is more than just doing. You are being a notary. You, your behavior has to, has to tell the world that you take your job seriously, you take your responsibilities seriously. So, of course, always act lawfully and ethically as a notary public. You must safeguard your notary tools. You know, I keep talking about public trust. You have to control access to those tools so that you are the only one who can ever have your seal, your record book, your commission certificate. If you are not the, the person who has sole control over those items, get that sole control because those are yours to hold and to keep safe. If you keep these items safe, you can certainly um, avoid any fraud that might be committed with those items. You have a responsibility to maintain updates to your commission information and status. If you have changes of address, if you um, have a change of name, you, the, the law and rules make you responsible for timely reporting of that. So again, that's another professional responsi responsibility, pardon me, that you cannot be remiss in. You always must reject improper coercion and you are the person whose acts evidenced on that notarial certificate will be responsible if something occurs because of or associated with that notarial act. Never, never, never allow yourself to go along to get along or satisfy a boss or try to make someone happy and submit to pressure to notarize when you really know that you shouldn't do it. That has gotten more notaries in trouble because I, I think, as a whole, notaries are in this in large part because you're helpful people. You want to serve the public. You want to provide this vital service. Sometimes that inclination can get the better of a notary. You can't discriminate in the provision of your services. That's pretty straightforward. You know, again, you're a public official um, representing um, this authority granted to you by the state of Texas to perform these official acts. So you have to provide those services in a non-discriminatory way. Um, you know, the, the, of course, all of the, um, the laws that exist that govern um, discrimination, you, you can't discriminate because of age, sex, religion, um, factors like that. So always, as a notary, be impartial. And then this is a tough one. Again, getting back to that helpfulness that notaries naturally have, you have to know to refuse to notarize when necessary. No matter how heartbreaking a situation might be, you are the person who knows what's proper in the performance of your duties. And sometimes, as much as you may want to help, you simply have to say no. And, and you have to know why you're doing it. You have to be able to do it. And you have to be able, again, to protect the public trust in your office by understanding that sometimes refusal is a way to accomplish that. So those are those basic fundamental responsibilities of office. It's who you are, all of these responsibilities. So embrace them. In addition to responsibilities, there are some very important prohibitions that, again, speak to the nature of what we're trying to have notaries be. Um, these are some of the most... Um, common prohibitions for, for notaries. If you look at your notary statutes and your notary rules, you'll see quite a bit of, um, of information there about things that you should not do, outright prohibitions, things that are not recommended. Um, the number one rule here in Texas, um, whether it's an electronic notarization for an electronic document or a traditional notarization on a paper document, the physical presence of the signer is absolutely required. There are no exceptions to that. 
Um, you, Texas has adopted a law that down the road will see um, the implementation of what we're calling online notarizations where presence is accomplished using audio video technology. But keep in mind, I just said the word, I just said the word presence. Presence is still accomplished no matter how each of these um, types of no notarizations are performed, whether it's online or it's, it's um, a traditional paper or electronic notarization, presence is being achieved. Today, for the notarizations that you can perform, it's physical presence only. Of course, don't notarize your own signature. How many of you, when you became a notary, wondered if you could notarize your own signature? Because we get that question a lot. OK, good. Uh, I'm always amazed, but I'm, I'm glad people ask because it's one of the most, um, most obvious errors that you can commit, and unfortunately there are no folks who become brand new notaries who will commit that. As a notary, you're never to alter or change the content of the document. This is essentially everything above um, the notarial certificate. Uh, some notaries have gotten in trouble for trying to help a signer complete a form trying to help um, the signer determine what should go in there or editing the form for the signer. Um, you are strictly prohibited from doing anything like that. Your territory on the document is the notarial certificate that is near, underneath, adjacent to the signer's signature and starts with the venue and extends on to your signature and seal. You can't ex execute a false notarial certificate. And that's, sometimes you may not realize that you've, you've executed a false notarial certificate. Um, I always suggest that if you're certifying to things that you are not authorized to certify to in your notarial certificate, you've, it, it, there's a statement in there that is not, um, not related to an authorized duty and you complete that notarial certificate, then you've essentially claimed to have a power that you don't have. That can get you in trouble. Um, also, sometimes, you know, notaries will complete a notarial certificate thinking, well, maybe this is correct, it will be okay, I think that these facts are all right, when in fact um, it ends up being absolutely incorrect. So always, if you, if you are going to complete a notarial certificate and attach those precious objects of your official signature and your official seal to that certificate, be absolutely confident that every word in there is something that you can certify to and that is absolutely correct. Um, you're not allowed to enter any kind of um, sensitive personal identifying numbers in your record book. I, I imagine that most of you are aware of that. It's um, you know, obviously a very sound um, privacy measure that's in your statute and in your rules, um, but it's very important that you not do that because your record and we'll talk uh, about this a little more later, but your journal record, your record book record, is public record. So by including numbers that are particularly sensitive, like social security number, um, any kind of personally identifying numbers, you run the risk of exposing someone to identity fraud or identity theft if you have to then produce a record of that notarial act. It's, um, so, so this is a really sound um, prohibition to follow. Never misrepresent notary public powers in any way, whether in advertising, in conversation, um, in how you, um, you know, represent your services or what you might do for someone, um, because you do have specific but limited powers. There are um, notarios in, in other countries that have more extensive powers than a US-based notary has, and that has led to some misunderstanding and confusion. But you know, you're a notary in Texas, in the United States, and again, you're, you're more of a ministerial officer. You are um, performing acts in accordance with the permissions granted to you and statute and rule, and you're following very prescribed procedures for your notarial acts. You're not, you don't have the leeway to to do a little give and take or try to um, draft some new thing as you're notarizing. You, you are, again, following very prescribed procedures. Um, I, I put this one in there because, again, it kind of speaks to the whole presence piece and, um, you know, not notarizing 
um, in inappropriate situations, performing notarizations by telephone. I think I found that in the, the Secretary of State's FAQs online, but there are notaries who actually think it might be okay, particularly if they know the signer. To have someone on the phone that they know very well, they, can, they, they personally know them, um, they're acknowledging, but they're over the phone. Again, remember, if you are not in the physical presence of the person for whom you're notarizing, you can't proceed with that notarization. And of course, you don't want to overcharge for your services. Talk about a way to lose the public trust and just do something that's terribly unfair. Um, you may not mean to. Be absolutely sure that you stay mindful of what statutes and rules say your authorized fees are and stick rigidly to that. Um, also, we'll talk about fees a little bit later, but um, in some states, notaries can charge fees for things like travel. In this state, you can't. So again, you know, be very familiar with your statute um, and, and what it says about the fees you can charge. So let's go ahead and having kind of talked about some of those overarching responsibilities that you have to yourself and to your office, let's start talking about the individual authorized notarial duties. And you can see them here. They're oaths and affirmations, which can occur um, either only verbally or it, the oath or affirmation can involve a signed document. You can take acknowledgments. You can take um, proofs of written instruments. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that. It's kind of an offshoot of an acknowledgment, if you will. You can certify copies of non-recordable documents. And you can take depositions and issue protests. I'll, I'll talk the least about those because I think probably they are the least common among this group. But again, they are authorized duties of a Texas notary. So let's start with oaths and affirmations. And I'm, I'm going to talk about oath, oaths and affirmations and acknowledgments first because overwhelmingly they are, they are the two most commonly performed notarial acts universally across the country. Um, the purpose of an oath or affirmation is to compel truthfulness under penalties of perjury about a statement or purpose. Pretty simple to understand. The, there's a difference between an oath or, and affirmation. Now, they do have the identical legal effect. Some folks, though, really don't prefer not to bind their conscience to a supreme being, to God. So with an oath, when this, um, this promise is made, you know, this oath is made, it's truthfulness before God. This person is swearing an oath, binding their conscience before God to the fact that they are telling the truth. An affirmation, this person is um, stating, um, making a statement about their truthfulness and, and under, under the pains of their own conscience. They are not obliging themselves to a supreme being. So that's, that's the fundamental difference, but keep in mind, they're identical. If you ever have a signer who doesn't care to invoke a supreme being or God, they can certainly take an affirmation and it is, you know, again, has the same legal effect. So, again, we have oaths and affirmations for a verbal transaction and the easiest example is an oath of office. And we also have oaths and affirmations for the execution of a document, when a document is being signed. You may hear me say, executing the document. You know, it's another way of saying, the signer signed the document and there were all these formalities of getting the document signed and maybe a notarization. That's execution of the document. Um, I may use those interchangeably, but um, oaths and affirmations are administered by notaries and they always require a verbal ceremony. Why? Because somehow you have to hear that sworn statement, that sworn oath. You have to hear that af affirmation. Sometimes we like to say notarization is not silent. You're always communicating with that principal about the steps in the notarial act. You're asking them for their ID. You're, you're carrying out these different steps and formalities. Verbal ceremony for the oath and affirmation and for the acknowledgement is an example of this. So, you know, an oath or affirmation for no document. I've given you an example here so you can kind of see how easy the substitution is um, with the language depending on whether the person is swearing an oath or affirming. 
do you, John Doe, solemnly swear in the red print, you'll uphold, uphold the duties of the office to which you've been elected, so help you God? That's an oath. All it takes to make that statement an affirmation is not saying solemnly swear or so help you God. Do you, John Doe, affirm you'll uphold the duties of the office to which you've been elected? And again, the same legal effect there. Okay, so we have oaths and affirmations for a signed document. Um, and in many jurisdictions, this particular iteration of the Notarial Act is called a verification on oath or affirmation. Um, as a matter of fact, the Revised Uniform Law and Notarial Act distinguishes oaths and affirmations for a signed document in this way. It calls them verifications. Um, so the oath, again, you can see the key language. Do you, John Doe, solemnly swear under penalties of perjury that the information contained in this document is the truth, so help you God? And then for the affirmation, you can see the simple substitution of the word affirmed and the omission of any references to a supreme being. Verbal ceremony is very important, and you'll see why when we look at the notarial certificate for an oath or affirmation. It's commonly referred to as a jurat. Um, some states will call verifications on oath or affirmations a jurat act. So the nomenclature can vary, but the function is still the same. Um, here you have, again, great evidence of what you're certifying to when you complete these notarial certificates. You're saying that the venue was the state of Texas, and you're going to write in the name of the county where you are physically present that day. Of course, all of you know your jurisdiction is statewide. You can be in any county on any given day and have authority to perform a notarial act. So that's your venue. You can see the language that you're looking for that indicates that the required notarial act will be an oath. That's sworn to. And some certificates will say sworn to or affirmed because there is a widespread recognition that either concept can be used. This is really important. The word subscribed, sworn to and subscribed, and then the additional words before me. First of all, I want to I address the before me piece. That is the part where clearly you are, if you sign the certificate and you seal it, you're certifying that the signer appeared before you and carried out these functions. So that, that before me piece will be in these notarial certificates for a signed document. It's very important for you to really recognize the technical aspects of, of again, what you're certifying to. Um, subscribed, that means signed. And this will be a key difference that you'll notice between an oath affirmation and an acknowledgement. For an oath notarial act, the document is always signed in the presence of the notary. Sometimes you may be presented with a document for, that requires an oath or affirmation and it's already been signed. In that case, because again, the act requires that you witness the signer signing this document, you'll need to ask the person to sign again, and you can do that. Um, we generally recommend that the signer not cross out the previous signature or anything like that. They simply affix their name again in your presence, and you can even make a note, signature, um, a duplicate signature affixed at request of notary. But again, remember that your certificate language is essentially dictating the facts to which you're certifying be sure that A, you have correct certificate language that um, properly reflect, reflects your authorized duty, and B, that these things really happened. Further in the certificate, you'll put the exact date of notarization. You'll also put the name of the person appearing before the notary. You can do this authoritatively because you've identified this person, and we'll talk a little bit more about identification. Finally, the act of essentially certifying to these facts occurs when you affix your official signature and your official seal. You can see that. So acknowledgments, as I've already mentioned, they differ from an oath affirmation. It, the purpose of an acknowledgment, excuse me, my throat's getting dry here, is for a person to declare and by so declaring acknowledge that they signed a document voluntarily for the purposes and consideration expressed in it. They're acknowledging 
that they signed, their acknowledging, their understanding, their acceptance, their willingness to sign this document. Acknowledgements can be made in multiple capacities. You have an individual capacity where a, a, an individual person will come before you and want to acknowledge their individual act. Um, and then you also have a representative capacity. The most familiar to you will be someone acting under a power of attorney. Again, with an individual capacity, this person is individually acknowledging his or her own act before the notary. In a representative capacity, the person who's actually the named signer of the document has given power or um, maybe this is for a corporation, but that person or that entity is not before you, but there is a representative with authority to acknowledge on that entity or person's behalf. And they'll do it, and that's the representative capacity. Again, I um, want to point out a key difference with an oath affirmation. Again, remember the jurat certificate language included the words subscribed before me. Well, that doesn't happen with the acknowledgement certificate, and you'll see that in a minute. It can, an acknowledgement, because the person is simply acknowledging their signature, they're not telling you, and, and they don't have an obligation to acknowledge that they signed the document yesterday at 10 a.m., or that they are acknowledging signing it here before you now. The, the, that particular piece of timing is not addressed in the acknowledgement certificate. It can be signed previously, or it can be signed in your presence. Obviously, it can't be signed at some point after the notarization, but an acknowledgement, um, a document requiring an acknowledgement might be presented to you and it will already be signed. That's perfectly fine. The only thing you need to be concerned about is your sense that the signature is what we call an original signature. On a paper document, for years and years, it, it's, it's been the case that on a paper document, an original signature is evidenced by a, what we call a wet ink signature. And you, you all know what that is. You know, you can, you can see that someone took a writing implement and stroked directly on the paper. There may even be indentions on the paper clearly indicating that they directly affixed that signature on the document. That's an original signature. Uh, a, a great example of something that appears to have been signed but doesn't have an original signature is when someone signs a document and then faxes it with the signature, and then that received fax that has a signature on it is presented to the notary for acknowledgement. Now, some of those long-held rules are changing somewhat with electronic signatures. It's, it's a constantly evolving sense of understanding what all of the permutations can be with electronic signatures, but for your purposes for today, to really understand what we mean by original signature and you know, when it's okay to uh, proceed on a document for acknowledgement that has already been signed. Just think of the difference between um, a wedding signature and some other signature that clearly wasn't applied directly to that document. There's a verbal ceremony also for an acknowledgement. And it's simply, do you, John Doe, acknowledge signing this document willingly for the purposes stated in it? Keep that language in mind, willingly, for the purposes and consideration stated in it. When we look at the acknowledgement certificate language, you are essentially, by completing this, of course, you're certifying to the facts that are clearly evident there. And also remember that an acknowledgement is the signer's acknowledgement of a certain level of intent. So if you don't have a verbal ceremony with that person to ask them to, to try to assess their intent, to have them declare their intent, their willingness to proceed, how would you necessarily be able to say that you properly assessed that? I mean, there, there are other ways that you might um, assess intent. Let's say you have somebody who comes before you and you feel they are clearly being pressured or, or coerced. Well, that's a different matter. but. Completing the verbal ceremony, as, as I've given this example, that allows the signer to hear this verbal ceremony and respond positively or negatively, whichever is, is the case, and again, indicate their understanding of, of the transaction and their willingness to proceed with it. 
So again, some of the same um, elements in the acknowledgement certificate that we have in the Jurat certificate. We've got the venue, of course. Um, we have the keyword acknowledged. Obviously, that differs again from sworn to and subscribed before me or affirmed before me for the oath. Um, we have the present statement before me, the exact date of notarization, again, the name of the principal appearing before you, and of course, the notary's official signature and seal once you have recorded all of the facts of the notarization in the certificate and you are confident that everything is correct, you apply your signature and seal. Now, you wanna be aware, now this is what we call the short form of acknowledgement certificate. Um, make a point after this, after this seminar of accessing the Secretary of State's website, um, wonderful informational um, materials there for you and samples of certificate language for a Texas notary. Samples are provided within that material. And the short form is perfectly acceptable for, for any type of um, notarial certificate. And there's short forms for the various notarial acts that are authorized. But there's also um, a requirement that if the notarial certificate language is not in the short form for an acknowledgement, and there is an acknowledgement performed, then that certificate language needs to express how the signer was identified. Um, and again, you'll see the difference um, in that certificate language and in the short form language that I'm presenting to you if you'll go and check all that out. Be absolutely sure that you are um, aware of those differences and can find those and, and recognize those. So that was an individual capacity. Um, very straightforward, um, John Doe appeared before me on a particular date and acknowledged uh, having signed the document willingly. Well, in a representative capacity, there's a little bit more recording of facts going on here because remember, you have an individual who is appearing before you who's not necessarily the named entity or the named signer. They are there in a representative capacity um, under the authority by the entity or person to appear on their behalf. So again, you have, as always, the venue. You see the language indicating the acknowledgement. You see the language indicating presence. You see the exact date of notarization. Now this is where it gets interesting for a representative capacity acknowledgement. The person who appears before you and who's identified by you and is transacting this notarization for you is not the named signer. It's the individual who has the representative capacity. That's the person who's named in the document because that's the person whose acknowledgement you'll take. They will give an acknowledgement to you and be named in your certificate uh, under a particular representative capacity. A, a very common one is attorney in fact for a power of attorney. Maybe, um, maybe someone is appearing as the president of a corporation. The capacity is their title and then the principal or entity representative, representatives, whoever has given that individual the authority to act in this representative capacity. So let's say I had power of attorney for my good friend John out there. Um, the, it would be my name appearing before the notary under name of representative. My title would be attorney in fact for John Smith, my good friend. Okay, and I've talked about a lot of these differences, so I won't linger too long on these, but this is a helpful chart that will help you recognize whether when you're presented with a document and you review the notarial certificate, you're looking at the obligation to perform an oath affirmation or an acknowledgement. So of course, in, in the first column, you know, principal swears to the truthfulness of the document's contents or affirms it versus the acknowledgement. The principal acknowledges he, she signed the document willing, willingly for its stated purpose. Um, notice the difference in um, the key language that you're looking for. Subscribe to and sworn to or, or affirmed before me indicates an oath affirmation. Acknowledge before me indicates an acknowledgement and so on. Um, that can be a very helpful chart for you to hang on to as if you're, if you're fairly new as a notary and you're getting used to um, the acts that you're supposed to perform when you see the notarial certificate, this can be very helpful for the two most common acts that you perform. Is that 
I, no, it is not, but it's in, the, it's in the, this presentation, and I think that the Secretary's Office will make it available after the conference, so I apologize for not, it not being in there, but yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Okay. At, at any rate, the, you know, I brought your attention to the chart, and it's, it's a real clear visual that absolutely will be available for you, so don't worry. If, um, if you don't have it, then you will have access to it. I won't spend a lot of time on proofs of um, written instruments simply because it's, it's an unusual circumstance, you know, we kind of, we have some limited time and I want to make sure that we spend a lot of time on the things that are, are more commonly encountered by you. But the main thing to know about a proof um, of written instrument is occasionally there is a situation where a document has been signed. The document required acknowledgement and particularly the document required acknowledgement so that it could be recorded for some reason, entered into the public record. Well, in some circumstances, the, the named signer has signed the document, but there's no indication that the acknowledgement was accomplished for this document. It did, does not appear that there was an appearance before the notary and that person's um, act of signing was acknowledged. So in some circumstances, um, and particularly when a document needs to be recorded, um, a, a law like this will allow a person who witnessed that individual sign the document and the witness was a subscribing witness, meaning that they actually signed the document as a witness, this process will allow that person to appear before the notary and basically swear an oath about what transpired. And that can serve, in a sense, as a substitute for the acknowledgement that didn't happen to begin with. Uh, I don't think they're very common, um, they're usually you know, they're there to take care of circumstances when it's important for a document to be recorded. I just wanted to make sure you were aware it's an authorized duty. Um, you know, there's another slide here, and again, you'll get all of the slides um, after, the, after the conference, but it just helps you see what the sworn oath is in the case of a proof by subscribing witness. And then there's a lengthy notarial certificate. I just highlighted the part that I really wanted to um, reinforce for you you know, in this entire process. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip on to this one because it's my experience that, it, particularly in states that authorize this particular notarial duty, it is hard on the heels of an oath affirmation and, and acknowledgments as the most commonly performed notarial act. We get a lot of questions about certifying copies of, of non-recordable documents. Um, I think that that language is actually in Texas statutes that, you know, it's certifying a copy of a non-recordable document. In other states, it's simply identified this act as certifying document copies. And then through best practices, it has to be reinforced that this does not apply to um, documents that are already part of the public record and can be certified by the official custodian. Um, the purpose of this act is to enable a document copy to be certified by you, this public officer, to be a true and complete copy of the original document. There's all kinds of reasons that people may need such a certified copy. Sometimes it's a letter, sometimes it's plans that they've drawn up, it, it can be any kind of um, document really. And again, not allowed for vital or public records or potentially recordable documents. Again, if, um, always the best course, if, if someone comes before a notary and they want to have um, a certified copy of a document made, and it's a document that absolutely will end up in the public record because that's customary for the document, it's far better for the individual to simply have the document recorded appropriately and then obtain a certified copy from the authorized um, custodian. If it's the clerk, then you know a clerk certified copy can be issued. Um, that's why we use the term recordable. It's not, this really isn't for, again, documents that are already part of the public record or are, are already a vital record, but it's also um, prohibited for documents that will end up in the public record and really should be certified um, as a copy by the official custodian. 
there's certain guidelines that you need to follow to properly certify a copy. And this is all meant, A, to, to make this notarial act really resonate, you know, and, and also to protect you and your statement. You, again, never a vital or public record or potentially recordable document. The document to be copied must be the original. And as we look at the notarial language you'll, uh, for the certificate, you'll see why some of these guidelines are here. You as the notary need to personally make the copy of the document from the original. That's really important. Often um, a, a customer will bring the original document and a copy and ask the notary to certify the copy, or they'll bring only the copy and ask the notary to certify the copy. Now these rules can vary from state to state, but as we look at the certificate language, you'll see why I'm making this point here. I think it's a best practice to review the identification of the document custodian, who's the person presenting the document and asking for a certified copy, because you generally name that person in your notarial certificate. Anytime you are naming an individual in your notarial certificate, even if it's not technically required in statute that you review that, that identification, I think it's very smart to take a look at their ID, ask if they would mind presenting their ID so you can properly name them in that certificate. And then when you complete the notarial certificate, if there's room on the document, you can write it on the document copy, or you can attach a separate sheet that fully contains the um, certificate on the copy. And I made several references to the certificate language, and this is why I pointed out some of the um, some of the guidelines that I did. Again, you're seeing a, you know, a familiar certificate format, the venue and the date of the notarization. Now here, what's interesting, first of all, you're not, um, this is not a signature notarial act. You're, there's no acknowledgement, there's no oath affirmation. This is simply your official certificate stating the facts about this um, document copy. You certify that the preceding or attached document is a true, exact, complete, and unaltered copy of the document presented to you by the document's custodian and then that person's name. So that's why I suggest that you identify that person. And first of all, I didn't, I didn't point out, you see the words made by me? That's in your notarial certificate that's recommended for use for this notarial act. It's why it's an important guideline for you to actually personally make that copy. In some states, the notary is allowed to literally take the original and a copy that was made out of their presence, if, if it was made out of their presence, and compare them. That can be a little trickier. At least if the copy is made by the notary, you know that you have an exact copy of what you put on the copier glass. So that's why that's in there. And of course, to the best of your knowledge, the photocopied document is not a public record or a vital record or a publicly recordable document. This, again, can be a very, very helpful notarial act to perform for the public. You just have to be very mindful that, again, the simple guidelines, be presented with an original document. Make sure that you make the photocopy of the document, again, because your recommended certificate language indicates that. And then if you're naming the document custodian in your certificate, make sure that you identify that person so you can feel confident that they, that the name you put in your certificate is actually their name. So some of your other authorized duties, um, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because we have so many other um, more commonly performed notarial acts that we can spend time on, but they are uh, taking of depositions, um, I guess in its purest form for a notary, and, and again, of course, all of this is subject to um, Texas rules of civil procedure, so you would need to have some expertise there, but essentially <clears throat> in this process, the notary might swear in a deponent, um, read a list of questions to, to the deponent, and then record the answers that that person gives to those questions, and then certify to the facts of that that deposition or the facts that were taken down by, by the notary. Um, again, specific expertise is, is generally necessary. 
So it's not something that you want to approach without a sound understanding of what the requirements are um, under Texas rules of civil procedure. And the notaries can also issue protests. And this is a long standing old notarial act that many, many states will allow. And it's really limited to financial matters concerning negotiable instruments. It's not very common at all for an everyday layperson notary to, to be presented with this one. Um, I just wanted to put it in because simply it is one of your authorized duties. Specific expertise is recommended. I will, will warn you that sometimes um, issuing of a protest is abused by um, people who want to commit some kind of document fraud using a document that bears the signature and seal of a notary because they may want to then have, for instance, the Secretary of State's office authenticate that not notarial act and have the statements that were made in the underlying document have a veneer of authenticity. So again, protests, unless you're in a, the financial sector dealing with negotiable instruments and situations surrounding them, it would be very rare that you would, you would encounter those. We doing okay so far? Everyone need to stand up, take a stretch? Okay, great. All right, so we've talked about, you know, why documents are notarized. We've talked about some of the fundamental responsibilities wrapped around what you do with notarization. We've looked at your authorized duties. And I like to talk about steps in a notarial act. If you want to consistently produce correct notarial acts, it's very, very helpful to have a standard procedure for marching through the steps of the notarial act making sure you're ticking all the boxes of your responsibilities when you're performing that act. So we're going to run through the steps that you see here. The first and the simplest is, is pardon me, is um, unfortunately one of the most common um, offenses that notaries will commit, and that's requiring the physical presence of the individual for whom the notarization is being performed. I mean, there, there's, there's just almost nothing to discuss about this because the concept is so very simple. If that individual is not physically present before you, where you can literally make physical contact with them, they're not in the next room, they're not down the street, they're not conversing with you by Skype, at least not today, not until your online notary law goes in effect, but, but that's not today. today you have to have the physical presence of the signer before you. If that's not happening, you absolutely cannot proceed. Not a lot to say about that. So then the second recommended step of notarization is to take the document presented and scan it for certain things. You need to, first of all, check for document completeness. It is never a good idea to notarize for a document that appears to be incomplete, and incomplete takes different forms. A lot of lay people see nothing wrong with handing just the signature page of a document to a notary and thinking that that's perfectly okay. They don't understand, they don't know. The notary needs to have all the pages of a document. Why? You're describing that document in your record book. How can you accurately describe the document if you don't even have all the pages so you can at least know it was a 10-page document. It was a two-page document. Maybe the name of the document's on one of those missing pages. If you can assess by simply looking at what was given to you that you don't have all of the pages of the document, then you need to ask for that and not, not proceed if you are not presented. Um, you also never want to notarize when there are material blanks in the document. This can be a little tricky to, um, to assess because you know, in cases where a document has blanks that clearly are meant to be completed later, like for office use only, there's, there's no reason that you can't proceed on that. But you want to feel confident that blanks that appear to materially affect whether the complete terms of the document are being stated at that time, if, if there are blanks like that, you want to call those to the attention of the signer and ask about those blanks. And should these blanks be filled in at this time, you know, and, and do you really intend to proceed with these blanks? 
We never recommend proceeding if there are material blanks in the document. Um, if they're there, you always want to ask the signer to deal with them. This is a case where you can get in a, a little pickle if the signer, signer is hoping that you can tell them what to do with the document at that point. How do I complete these blanks? But you can't get involved at that level. You simply bring it to the signer's attention, ask the signer to address them in some manner, and if the, if the incomplete nature of the document can't be addressed at that time, you can't proceed with notarization. You scan the document to also view what the required notarial act is, and this is when your knowledge of notarial certificates comes into play for you. Remember, if you see language that says, subscribed and sworn to before me, well, you know that that's an oath or affirmation notarial act. If you see certificate language that says, acknowledged before me, well, obviously, you're being asked to perform an acknowledgement. You want to assess the notarial wording to make sure that it doesn't have statements in it that would cause you to certify to things you're not authorized to certify to. We talked about that a little bit earlier, but it's very important. Sometimes folks don't understand that notaries have very prescribed official duties. They can't just certify to anything that addresses a signer's particular need. It, it, we see this a lot with self-created documents, and they can even be self-created in an office environment where the office has a business purpose. They simply don't understand that a Texas notary can't certify to the truthfulness of um, a, a contract that was executed on a given day. You will see certificate language with that level of detail in it. Always make sure that you can recognize when the certificate would have you certifying to things that you are not authorized to certify to. And at that point, you can correct the notarial certificate if it um, is just so out of line that you may need to use a different fresh notarial certificate. As long as you are confident that the signer is directing you that yes, they do want an acknowledgement act or they do want an oath, you can add the correct notarial certificate language to the document. You either write it on or you can attach it as a loose notarial certificate. Actually, it's not loose notarial certificate. You will be completing a certificate perhaps on a loose sheet of paper but then attaching it to the document and making it a permanent part of that document. You also scan the document to view who the named signers are. Uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. Sometimes you have one si signer. Sometimes you have multiple signers. Sometimes you have witnesses whose signatures don't require notarization, but then you, you will have signers whose signatures do. You need to see who are named signers in the document, whose signatures in the document indicate the need for a notarial act. Are those individuals before you? Um, that reminds me of something I may not bring up later, so I want to mention this. Let's say we have a document that has multiple named signers, and every one of those signers' signatures requires a notarial act. A lot of notaries are worried that they have to have every signer before them together at the same time in order to notarize at all, and that's not the case. If you have multiple um, named signers, multiple signers whose signatures require an, a notarial act, and just one is before you, you may proceed for that one signer. It's really important that when you fill out your notarial certificate, you indicate that, that the notarial act was for the single signer who appeared before you that day. And then a lot of times um, I will recommend that let's say if only one named signer out of three appeared and you notarized for that one signer that day, when you put their name in the notarial certificate, you write the word only afterward. And maybe you even put little X's around, around the blanks on each side of that name so a name can't be added to your certificate later. That is a um, really important concept for you to have. Um, I, I know of notaries who have turned away a perfectly valid notarization for a single signer because all of the multiple signers who required notarization weren't present. And be aware that you can notarize for that single person. You want to check for witnesses. Um, I think that you can get yourself in a situation if you are trying to counsel on the circumstances of a witness for documents, but in a situation where it's very evident that a witness is required for the signer's signature, and particularly if the, if the individual is there 
and they're making, they're taking an oath or affirmation, signing the document before you, you know that the, the name signer's signature event is occurring in your presence. If the document requires witnesses, you want to bring that to the signer's attention so that they can deal with that shortcoming. That's just a very helpful thing to do for your signer. You want to review the document or, the, or signature date. Again, documents presented for acknowledgement, they can be signed prior to the person appearing before you. Well, what if they've post-dated that signature? Then anyone looking at that document after you notarize would think that perhaps you performed an improper act. A signer signature needs to be dated the same date as notarization or earlier, of course not later. You can't notarize for a post-dated um, post signature. You know, there's a little bit of debate about the document date. Um, our association has always taught that if the document is dated later than the date of notarization, um, it's not recommended that you proceed. That can be a little bit, um, you know, more flexible. It just depends on the purposes of the document. I think there's one state that actually has a provision for future dated documents allowing the notary to proceed. Simply be mindful of, of what you're seeing in the document concerning dates. Date of any signature that's already in the document, date of the document. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you want to determine if the signature on the document is original. This applies mainly if the document's already signed and the, the notarial act requires an acknowledgement. You want to again feel confident that that's a wedding signature. If it's a notarial act for an oath or affirmation, and the document's um, already been signed, of course, as I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that the signer is willing to sign that document again for you so that you can witness that original signature as the Oath Affirmation Act requires. You also want to scan a document to determine how to record the details of the document in your record book entry. That gets back to the point about make sure you have all the pages of the document. To make an absolutely accurate description of the document in your record book entry, you need to know how many pages, uh, the date of the document, all these various um, data elements and, and information about the document that would help you accurately recall the events of the notarization in case there was ever a question about it. Sometimes litigation will occur years after you've notarized the document. This is a, another reason that you should actually be very thankful that you have a record book requirement here. You have a situation where you are creating your own personal record of an event of notarization for which you were the officiating notary, and <clears throat> there's no way of, of telling really how far down the line you might be asked to testify and recall details of that particular notarial act. If you're relying only on your memory, good luck. But you have a record book entry that was carefully made that has detail that will help you down the line recall, you know, the essential circumstances of the notarial act. And so that's why you want to scan the document just enough to be sure that you can make those descriptions in your record book. So next step of notarization, discuss fees. Fees, of course, are optional. <clears throat> you can decide to charge, you can decide not to charge. Um, some notaries choose not to charge simply because they're, it's not important to them or they're not in a situation where they feel it's necessary to get a fee for their service. But certainly the law allows you to charge a fee and your, your services are valuable. If you wish to charge a fee, you may certainly do so. Um, if you're going to charge a fee, always disclose the intent to charge the fee before you get too far into the notarial process. That's why we mention it here. Once you've examined the document and you know what notarial act is required, then you can see, again, you have a, a fee schedule here, you can see what it is you might charge for that. Um, that's why you don't necessarily discuss fees right up front because maybe you haven't examined the document yet, you don't know the required notarial act, you don't have a sense of what the fees will be. This is the point when you do it. And again, you want to disclose before you go any further. And again, your statutes uh, require you to either itemize the fees you may charge or be prepared to itemize the fees that you will charge. So 
earlier when we were talking about some of your essential equipment, I recommended um, a little a, a little booklet uh, that looks where you can make little invoices or make a list of fees like a receipt book. Just have that in your toolkit so that you are prepared, if, and particularly if someone asks for a receipt for your fees, that's very important. Don't forget that posting of your fees is required. And also um, that fees for additional expenses are prohibited. You can charge only the fees um, that are in statute for statutorily authorized notarial acts. And again, notaries in some other states can charge for various things like travel or if they provide services that are outside the notarial act, like making um, document copies or, or things like that. But here in Texas, it's only, um, the fees are only there for actual authorized duties that you perform. And then the allowable fees to charge are um, in the chart there. I have the, the ones in bold highlighted simply because, again, they're the most common notarial acts that, that I think notaries are asked to perform. And some of the others are, you know, the deposition and the protest, far less common. But again, this is detail that you need to have. Okay, number four, identify the signer. This is one of the most mission critical things that a notary will do. I'm gonna take a quick look here at how we're doing on time. Um, and I, I just urge you to take all care in examining the identification of a signer. It's, remember we talked earlier about some of the assurances of the Notarial Act, that the fact that a public officer is certifying that a, a, a particular named individual came before them and carried out the steps of notarization, that's really important for relying parties. Be very, very thoughtful and considerate of, of what your requirements are when you look at identification. You can identify a document signer either by personal knowledge, which by the way, I think you all realize it's not a casual knowledge of someone. It's not casual at all. If you don't have a long time regular interaction with someone that leaves very little to no doubt in your mind about their identity, then go ahead and ask to see um, an identification. There are, um, co-workers that, that I would not hesitate to ask for identification from simply because I know them anecdotally, that their name is you know, Mike Jones because that's what everyone at the office calls this person, but do I have a personal relationship with this person? Do I know this person um, for a number of years and to the extent that I have no doubt about that identity? No. Um, so, so feel no hesitation whatsoever if you would like to see the individual's identification card because you don't necessarily believe that you have quite enough familiarity to say that you personally know them, don't hesitate to do that. It's just being thorough and um, conscientious as a notary. Uh, your forms of satisfactory identification are documentary or um, you can use a credible witness. And you can see there the requirements for the documentary forms of um, satisfactory identification. A current identification card or other document issued by the federal government or a state government that has the photograph and the signature of the person. Um, now your statutes identify this requirement for acknowledgments. We recommend that all signers who come before you for whatever notarial act be identified, again, because you are naming that person in a notarial certificate, you are naming that person in your journal record, um, you want to go ahead and, and identify that person for any notarial act that you perform for them. We've got a couple of examples of um, identification documents that suit these, um, these metrics here. Um, a foreign passport is allowed only with respect to a deed or other instrument relating to a residential real property um, transaction. That's the only time you can look at a foreign passport as a form of satisfactory identification. So it was worth definitely bringing that to your attention. Um, another form of um, satisfactory identification is the oath of a credible witness who was personally known to you. It creates what we call a, a chain of knowledge from the signer to the credible witness to you. A credible witness will personally know the signer and then you personally know the credible witness. So you can take that individual's um, oath or affirmation about 
the identity of the signer who has no identification and can't, and you don't personally know them. Um, that's always going to be a verbal oath. Some states require an actual written affidavit for the oath of a credible witness, but here in Texas, a verbal oath is, is perfectly sufficient for a credible witness. Anytime you use a credible witness, you always record the fact in your record book. And I've got very limited time here. We have way more material than we could possibly cover. I'm going to, let's see, let's make some decisions here. <laughs> We've talked a bit about the notarial certificate, which is the last step of the notarial act. Um, We've talked about identifying the signer. Let's see. Let me, I'm just looking here at my notes about, um, let's skip that. Let's go to, to completing the notarial certificate and some of the don'ts associated with that. And I apologize, we all, we all knew that, we, that both my colleague Mike and I were gonna have way too much material for the time, um, but I hope it leaves you hungry for more. <laughs> We'd love to come back and, and see you guys again. Um, which one am I looking for here? Step seven, sorry. Okay, here we go. Complete the notarial certificate. This is really important. Again, that, that evidence of your notarial act is so mission critical. You are required to complete it at the time of notarization. Many notaries make the mistake initially, early on, of thinking that because the signer's in a hurry or they're in a hurry or, or whatnot, they, they can, and, and this happens particularly in an office environment where the notary may end up having custody of the document after notarization, they think they can complete the notarial certificate at some later time. Absolutely not the case. Anytime you complete a notarial certificate, it is part of the present notarial act that you're performing. So you always want to complete that certificate um, while the signer's still before you at the same time as the notarial act. Um, you'll see some state statutes refer to this as contemporaneously with the notarial act, meaning that acts, this is all part of the notarial act. It's not something to be done ahead of time. Some notaries will pre-fill notarial certificates thinking that that's a great time saver, but it's actually poor practice. You only want to complete a notarial certificate at the time that is appropriate for that certificate to be completed. Um, correcting certificate wording. Again, we talked about not um, altering the contents of the document. Anything up above the notarial certificate is the, it constitutes the content, contents of the document. Anything in the notarial certificate, that is, is your area of authority. You need to be sure that Whatever you sign and seal in that notarial certificate, it, is, um, it reflects the requirements of Texas statutes. It doesn't have you certifying to things that you're not authorized to certify to. It correctly re reflects the facts of the notarial act. I have so little time here. Make sure with your record book entries. Um, again, wonderful statutes and rules that vary um, very explicitly provide the details of what you must record in the record book. Make sure you understand what those data points are. Um, in, in many, many states that require a record book, the signature is required. That is not the case here in Texas. So it is a very good idea to ask the signer to give a signature in your record book. It is one way that you can establish um, plausibly that that person was present before you for the notarial act. If they absolutely refuse to give you the signature, that alone is not a reason to reject the notarial act and, and refuse to proceed. Just, just be aware, it's a really good idea to try to get it. Um, but don't pressure the signer to give it. And usually because it's generally a blank in the record book format, they will give you that certificate voluntarily, um, pardon me, that signature voluntarily. So, I, these were challenging notarizations that I knew I wouldn't have time for anyway, so I could spend another couple hours, and I, you've all been listening so intently, and 
you know, generally we have more of an opportunity for give and take. And I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to do this. And I hope that by covering the material in this way, by talking about the why, what's, and how's of notarization, you're not thinking of notarization only from the standpoint of the individual procedural steps that you follow when you're simply completing a certificate and taking a, a signer's identity and, and doing those things. But I really hope you have a broader sense of what it means to be a notary, the responsibilities of your office, how upholding those responsibilities promotes public trust, it enhances the relevance of your office. Um, all of these things that we talked about earlier, how the way you perform notarizations continues to uphold the value placed in the assurances of notarization. Notaries are relevant. What you do is relevant. If you are not told that every day, then you're around people who really don't appreciate what you bring to the table by putting yourself out there, exposing yourself to the, the difficulties and the liabilities of being that person who will certify to the facts in a notarial act. I want to thank you very much for having the commitment to your office to be here today. Um, never stop seeking knowledge. No one knows it all. Um, I hope that you know, we can talk some more in a Q&A, and I want to encourage you to be lively and participate you know, participatory because those of us who are so-called experts, we learn from you every day. You are front line. You are dealing with customers and seeing documents that we may never see. So again, I want you to be very, very sure of the value of your office, what you do for the public, and that what you do is important. Thank you very much.